bless us with wisdom and understanding. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 and following. <clears throat> now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And Aaron held his peace. This is the word of the living God. I'm not going to read the rest. This is the word of the living God. May the Holy Spirit sanctify us as we meditate on these deep truths that are revealed here. This is a mysterious passage. All of Scripture is mysterious, but some seem to be even greater in their mystery. And here we certainly have that. This is a mysterious passage. You might be wondering why I would choose to read such a, uh, a dour passage. I haven't been here for probably a year or so. No, I'm, I'm not trying to lay the boots to you, the, <laughs> the spiritual boots. I'm actually doing a sermon series um, on uh, true worship and looking at Leviticus uh, through the lens of Leviticus to learn about true worship, what God ordains uh, for His church. Looking at the Old Testament and seeing the principles uh, that are applied are applicable to the to the New Testament, and so we um, in uh, in this sermon series we've looked at, at many uh, the, many of the chapters, including chapters eight and nine, which immediately precede, of course, chapter ten, the passage we we just began to read. And in eight, we see how the people of Israel begin to prepare for this worship, and then in chapter nine we see the actual worship that Aaron and his sons, who have been preparing for for this day, begin the actual worship, the proper worship. But they've been trained. There were words that, uh, that God had issued to command them on what to do and what not to do, and there was warnings for them not to do certain things, not, for instance, to leave the, uh, the camp, but to remain in the presence of the tabernacle and to, to remain there for seven days. And, and then they're trained. For seven days, there's this intensive training that goes on. And they go through the sacrifices one after another again and again to train themselves, prepare themselves for this important day. This is the day that the Lord is going to meet His people. He's promised to be um, their God and to visit them and to be with them as their God. And it all centers on the tabernacle and the tabernacle worship. This worship that God had revealed to them. Sunday is the day when Christians around the world come to their local church to join in the service of worship to the Lord. They sing hymns, pray, and most importantly, hear the Word of God delivered by the minister for the blessing of their everlasting souls. Some come in faith, trusting in the finished and perfect work of Christ. Others come for other reasons. Some come because the Lord has graciously opened their eyes and their heart to see the loveliness of Christ. Others come because they had to come. Family tradition, social standing, or a worldly guilt brings them to church. If you're a child, then you're brought here because your mom and dad told you so. Some have surrendered their fight against the Lord and have set down their, their instruments, their tools of rebellion, and have received a peace that passes all understanding. And because they are begotten from above by the imperishable seed of the living God, they have new life and new affections and new desires. They wish to please God, who they now know as their heavenly Father. He's no longer um, storm and lightning and thunder. He is now a loving and gracious God. And they also see Jesus not simply as a wise teacher or a wonderful example, 
but they see him for who he truly is, their Savior and their elder brother, who has died for their sins and risen from the grave, that they too might conquer sin and death, just as he has done. And they are indwelt by the Holy Spirit so that they have the power to do so. So they can actually mortify the flesh. In other words, they know God personally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Others, well, others come to church. Um, I'm sorry, others who come to church may know these things, but the truth hasn't sunk in. It hasn't moved them. They haven't been changed from the inside out. The hymns are not songs of joy, of salvation, that God has wrought in their hearts, <clears throat> because their hearts are still stony and dead in their trespasses. The prayers that they say, if they do say them at all, are merely formal or habitual or lifeless, and therefore they lack all power, all spiritual power. And the sermon... Well, the sermon they hear goes in one ear and out the other. They don't listen to the sermon. Rather, they endure it. They allow themselves to be distracted by any other thing than the preached word. They twiddle their hair, pare their fingernails, plan the upcoming week's menu. Maybe they catch a nap or, or sit quietly and judge others and their physical appearance, or their clothing, or their personal idiosyncrasies, or, or whatever, whatever seems to um, irk them. They will do anything, these people, but pay attention to the means of grace that God has ordained for the conversion of souls and the building up of the saints. They do not listen to the sermon because they have no real interest in Christ the Savior. In the lesson before us today, two men epitomize souls who have no genuine, life-giving interest in God, Nadab and Abihu. These men who were chosen by God to serve him as priests in the tabernacle were proud, vain, haughty men who felt no compunction to submit themselves to the Lord, even though they ministered to the Lord in his tabernacle, or at least in his precinct, the precincts of the tabernacle. They were close to God, very close, but it was only or merely a physical closeness. Spiritually, they were far from Him. When they handled the things that the Lord had set apart for His holy service, they treated these things like they were nothing, like they were no consequence. They knew what God commanded, for instance, um, what fire and what incense to burn, but they deliberately chose to do their own thing instead, offering God what God had never requested, had never commanded. Their sinful attitude incensed the Holy One of Israel, and they were struck down in the prime of their life, dead in a moment. This was judgment by divine fiat. It was a dreadful judgment, there's no doubt about it. Their father, imagine it, Aaron, the high priest, saw the whole thing with his very own eyes. They would have been standing right next to him in service with him. He had been serving right beside his sons when the heavenly fire consumed them. And the question is, what would he do now? How would he respond? Would he remain faithful to the Lord? Or would he despair and, and, uh, and drift off as so many do when, when there's hard providence that they encounter. Well, let's turn our attention in a moment to the rest of the sermon to see what Aaron does, how he responds. The lesson before us now is full of bracing truth and sobering insights. Bracing truth and sobering insights. But we need to remember through all of this, through all of the judgment of God, that our hope is in nothing less than the eternal Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. In this life and in the next, our Savior is Christ, and He saves us, saves us from God's just judgment. He shows us tremendous mercy instead. He takes the punishment that we so richly deserve so that we be, can be set free from the condemnation of the law and set on a sunny plateau beside 
the Savior and in fellowship with other believers. And we look forward to the day when we will see God, the very God, with our very own eyes. Let's look a little closer at this passage. The first main major point that we can um, discern from this passage occurs in verses 1 and 2. And they are, the first major point is the Lord executes a dreadful judgment. The Lord executes a dreadful judgment. Our God is a holy God who must deal with man's sin according to his own divine justice. He can't let it go. Aaron's two oldest sons, mind you, these were the old These were the senior boys. These were the elder sons. Make an offering before the Lord. The passage begins with Nadab and Abihu making an offering to the Lord. They do so as priests who have been ordained by God to carry out such duties. Very important duties, and these guys have been training for it. They're ready, they're prepared. God has given them everything that they need to carry out these duties properly. He's given them clear, clear instructions. And then he has had them go through a number of dry runs, seven of them uh, in total, and working on this and working on it. So they, they have everything perfectly down so that on the critical day, the day of actual proper worship, they would be able to function properly and do what was right in God's sight. They take a censer, each one, put fire in it, and add incense on it. But from there, it, it goes downhill. The Bible describes their offering as strange fire in the, New, in the King James Version, the New King James Version, or in the ESV, unauthorized fire. It says, and they offered unauthorized fire <clears throat> before the Lord. Well, what is it about the offering that makes it wrong, makes it unauthorized? It's not actually clear. There's some speculation, but it's not entirely clear what was wrong with this fire. Is the fire wrong? Is the incense wrong? Is it a combination of fire and incense Incense that is wrong? Or is it something else entirely? Maybe we're looking at the material realm and we're focusing on that when really we should be looking at the immaterial realm. Their hearts, their minds. Maybe that's where the, the source of the problem lay. Scripture states clearly that Whatever it is they offer, it is not commanded of the Lord. They are running on their own. They're like mavericks, inventing as they go along. It was fire which he, that is God, had not commanded them. Is it a problem with their skill set? Are they incompetent? Perhaps they need more training. That's possible. Possibly they need more training. Is it a problem with their cognitive state? It sounds like they might have been drunk because later on, if we were to read this passage later on, you would see that, that Moses, by command of God, tells Aaron not to ever come drunk to the tabernacle. That's always a good, a, a good caveat. Never, the minister should never come drunk to, uh, to worship. You could imagine how uh, scandalous that would be um, if a minister came drunk, but these Boys, they were young men, might have come drunk. Maybe they needed to dry out. Or is it a problem with their heart and with their mind? Is it an inner problem? Are they proud? Are they pushy? Most likely, Nadab and Abihu had proud hearts. Their position had probably got the better of them. Scripture tells us that um, young men or men early or new to the faith should not hold public or um, church office because they might suffer from the same sin as Satan, the sin of pride. It might go to their head. These were young men. Maybe, maybe their position, their power, their authority went to their head. Whatever it is, as a consequence of the strange fire they offer, they are killed. We know that it's not, whatever they did was not commanded. They seemed to deviate from the orders that God had given, the commands that God had given, the very clear commands. And they deviated from that. Who sends this fire that consumes Nadab and Abihu? Well, the uh, the word of God is perfectly clear on this point. It's God himself who takes the life of these men. Sometimes when God meets out divine justice, he uses what's known as secondary means. 
to accomplish his holy purpose. So, for instance, he uses David the king as an instrument, or who would become king, as an instrument of justice to punish the arrogance of Goliath. Right? He, he equips and, and ordains David, a man, to act on his behalf, and David, by the strength of his arm, of course, sustained by God's power, shoots the sling, um, hits Goliath in the head with the stone, and, and um, Goliath topples over. God uses a man, David, to accomplish his purposes. The man, um, it continues to, um, to uh, or God's secondary means also includes the slingshot, the stone, um, David's power, the strength of his arm, but it's God's ordaining of this moment. He's used this secondary means. Other times, God meets out his divine justice directly and instantly. He doesn't use secondary means. He um, acts of his own accord. He strikes out in his own power. And the passage before us vividly illustrates this point. The Lord God Almighty is the one who strikes down Nadab and Abihu on his own, without the mediation of secondary causes. The transgression they committed is so egregious in God's eyes that God himself demonstrates his outrage for all to see. Remember, if we were to read chapter 8 and 9, we would see that the whole congregation was to assemble before the tent of meeting to witness this wonderful event. And it was a wonderful event. It began as a wonderful day. This was the day that the Lord would um, come down from heaven and, um, uh, and tabernacle with his people, visit them, and bless them, and minister to them. And it began with, with a great fanfare. Offerings were made, sacrifices were, were offered. It was a wonderful day. But then the strange fire is given, and everything turns south. The transgression that Nadab and Abihu committed is so egregious that God acts himself. He must demonstrate his outrage. His wrath isn't veiled, but it is fully displayed to the whole congregation so that everybody witnesses it. It would have been, to say the least, very startling. What is the reason for God's direct punishment? Because Nadab and Abihu made an offering that was not authorized by God. It's that simple. God had ordained what was pleasing to him in worship, and he warned that there would be consequences if that set of orders were transgressed. Nadab and Abihu transgressed those orders. Well, how should we respond to this description of God's punishment? I mean, what are we to do with this? God is mercy. God is grace. God is love. Here he is striking down Nadab and Abihu over what seems to be such an inconsequential thing. Strange fire. But as we've seen, it wasn't inconsequential at all. Even what seems to be small and inconsequential in worship is tremendously important to God, the living God, the Holy One of Israel. It is a punishment that should fill each one of us with a sense of awe, and yes, maybe even dread. The fire, as we have noted, originates from heaven. It's described as coming out from before the Lord. It's the same fire which earlier had consumed the, the sacrifices. In Leviticus chapter 9, verse 24 there, there it describes a fire that comes out from before the Lord that consumes the sacrifice. It seems like it, it comes out from heaven and consumes the sacrifices. And it's this same fire, this heavenly fire, originating from the Lord God Almighty that now kills Nadab and Abihu. Verse 2 says, And fire came out from, God, from, the, uh, from before the Lord and consumed them, that is the men, and they died before the Lord. God takes deviations from his commands and his word and his covenant very seriously. Sometimes we forget that. You know, especially if we've been in the church for any length of time, we can be very comfortable with the things of God. 
We can come into the sanctuary and, and not really be cognizant of the tremendous privilege and blessing that we have in coming before the living God and worshiping Him. We can treat things very cavalierly, and even in an offhanded way. We don't mean to. We just sort of slip into it. When the nation of Israel sins against God, breaking the covenant between themselves and God by doing what they know is displeasing to God, they suffer the consequences for their transgression. First, Israel, the northern kingdom, is invaded. Its people slaughtered and the survivors enslaved. And the northern kingdom, from that moment forward, evaporates in time. It never rises again. The northern kingdom is salted. Next, Judah, the southern kingdom, is invaded and overrun by an invading army. Jerusalem itself has destroyed the, 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 the beautiful city of Jerusalem. It was the apple of God's eye is destroyed. Its citizens put to the sword, and those who survived are sold into slavery. What was going on? The nation was beloved of God. He had done everything for her, as Ezekiel 16 tells us. God knew Israel, according to Ezekiel 16, God knew Israel from the time that she was a baby, so to speak. He took care of her through childhood, through her childhood, providing her with everything that she needed. He clothed her. He fed her. He gave her a place of honor. And thus, when she became mature, God betrothed himself to her. He would be her God, and she would be his bride. God entered into a covenant with Israel the way a husband enters into a marriage covenant with his wife. Into with his wife. Both covenants are based on love and trust. The covenant between God and Israel and the covenant between a man and a wife. But it's also based on fidelity and purity. When we marry our beloved, we expect that our beloved to be pure, to be faithful. And God expects Israel to be pure and faithful to him and him alone. But the nation Israel proved to be an unfaithful bride. She chased after other gods, Ezekiel 16 tells us, who weren't really even gods, but were false idols. She loved worldly pleasures and worldly power. She threw herself at anyone who would pay a little attention to her. And in this way, she proved a thousand times over that she was completely untrustworthy and deeply, deeply wayward and even sinful. There are consequences to sin, and Israel would learn the hard way of those consequences. And this brings us back to Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu were not simply ignorant or incompetent or even drunk, although those things might have been true. That might, they might have, there might have been some truth in that. But when they offered strange fire, there was more going on than just ignorance or incompetence or even drunkenness. They were acting unfaithfully before the living God who had called them, ordained them, trained them, and clothed them. They were acting unfaithfully before Him. And they were doing so not just in their everyday, ordinary life, behind closed door when no one could see them, no, they were doing it at a critical moment during the worship service, the first day of the tabernacle worship service, the official opening of the tabernacle. They do it, and they do it publicly, and they do it in front of everyone who has already seen them for seven days doing it properly. So the people would have known, there's something going on here. These guys are acting oddly. They're mavericks on their own. This would have been very concerning to the people. They were acting unfaithfully at a critical moment when the incense was being offered to God. This was a picture of the prayers of, of the priest going up to God. As the, the people of the, the congregation were assembled there and they would see the incense lit and the smoke going up, they would say, that's like our prayers. Our prayers are going up to God too. And they would praise the Lord. And they would be so joyful because their prayers were being heard by the living God in heaven. But those, um, that incense, that fire was strange that the, the young men offered. Well, what can we learn of this fire? 
most obvious thing is when, when God consumed these men, he was demonstrating his divine justice. God is grace, but he is also just. And he must punish sin and wickedness. And he does so directly, immediately, and in a, in a very dramatic way at this moment. It was also an exhibition of his divine wrath. He punishes transgressors. Numbers chapter 15, verse 30, beginning at verse 30, declares, But the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he is a native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people, because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be on him. Stern words. Sobering words. Bracing words, even. Words that might even bring a chill to us when we think about them. God is concerned about how people worship him. And he's very concerned, obviously, about ministers in the New Testament, priests in the Old Testament. But he's also concerned about worship amongst his people in the congregation as well. So it should prick up our ears when we hear uh, a, a warning like this. Now, we need to be, be clear on one thing. God has sent the Lord Jesus Christ to die for our sins. He is our righteousness, and we're looking to, uh, for our hope in him. But we have to ask ourselves some questions. What, if any, strange fire do you and I bring to church when we come before the Lord? Do we bring strange fire in the sense that are we doing something that we know goes against the obvious, clear commands of God? Each one of us needs to answer that question for ourselves. You know your heart better than anybody. Maybe your spouse or a close friend or family or, or mom or dad, no. But what if any strange fire do you bring to the church? Do you realize if you are bringing something innovative and different and something that's not authorized, that you stand in a position much like Nadab and Abihu? We need to take this seriously. Are you sloppy and indifferent in your worship? Do you come intoxicated, maybe not by booze, or maybe, maybe so, but intoxicated by the world, by the flesh, by the distractions of the world? Are you wrapped up in Vanity Fair, as John um, told us about in his book, Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan? Do you presume to tell God what is what? Are you trying to invent your own worship? Important questions that no one really can answer but yourselves. Look in your heart. Examine yourself. Another major point that is worth noting is Moses explains to Aaron why God struck down his sons. You can imagine, Aaron was thunderstruck. He has been, this is the, the, the high point in his life, no doubt. He's been preparing for this moment for some time, um, and now he is going to offer God uh, everything that God has ordained and lo and behold, his sons, his elder sons, are struck down. He must have been thunderstruck. Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. And Moses speaks peace to him. Moses says, among those who are near to me, I will be sanctified. And before all people, I will be glorified. Those are the words that Moses speaks to Aaron as Aaron is grieving over his son, or is thinking about grieving over his son. God does not remain silent, but reveals his will that he might be known and loved and obeyed by his people. Moses provides an explanation for the judicial punishment that he has just, has just been meted out. Although the message is delivered by Moses, Moses is the one that speaks these words to Aaron, it is ultimately God who speaks the words to Moses. God is using Moses as a mediator to speak to Aaron so that Aaron understands how to respond. It is God Almighty himself who explains the death of Nadab and Abihu. He declares, among those who are near me, that would include the high priests and the priests, uh, among those who are near me, 
I will be sanctified, and before all the people, I will be glorified. God will be sanctified, and God will be glorified by those who draw near to him. Brothers and sisters, we are drawing near to God. We draw near to God every Sabbath day. When we come in the morning and the afternoon, we come to worship him, we come to sing his praises, we come to pour the contents of our hearts out to him, to love him for all that he has done, giving us his Savior, or giving his, his beloved Son our Savior. We come to worship him. We draw near to him. And he will be sanctified and glorified by those who draw near to him. He will be sanctified and glorified by you. Individually, as a congregation, as a denomination, he will be sanctified and glorified. We can be sure that the entire congregation at this moment in ancient Israel, including Moses and Aaron, were struck with horror at the death of Nadab and Abihu, as we always already noted. However, Moses takes steps to minister to the congregation in general and to Aaron in particular. Aaron is grieving. Moses is his brother. So he would have been moved to see Aaron's tears and his grief he wasn't impervious to Aaron's plight. Quite the opposite. However, Moses takes steps to minister to the congregation in general and to Aaron in particular. Moses is composed. He doesn't melt down. He doesn't weep. He doesn't fall apart. He doesn't cry on somebody's shoulders. Instead, he sucks it up. He soldiers ahead. He's strong impervious to what's happened. Not because he's hard-hearted, because he sees the greater purpose, the greater good. No doubt Moses is personally grieved by the loss of these young men and ordained priests. He's lost some good priests. He's lost his, his nephews, his own flesh and blood. And although everyone else is clearly devastated and expresses their anguish openly, no doubt, Moses remains in control of himself. In fact, not only does he remain in control, he, take, he takes care to keep good order, as Matthew Henry puts it in his commentary. One of the fruit of the Spirit, or one of the manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, is it not? Paul lists the, um, the manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit, and they include love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit includes self-control. And this man is a man beloved of God, Moses, who has the Holy Spirit dwelling within him. God has given him a tremendous calling to lead the people of Israel to the promised land, to be, as it were, their king, a representative of God. And he cannot fold like a cheap suit at this point. He has to remain resolute. And he does. Moses understands a grand truth that many today forget or have never known. God's priorities are far more important than our daily lives and our travails. God's priorities are far more important than our own. God's priority is that he saves a people for himself. That's his priority. It's priority number one in the church, or it ought to be. He is not going to compromise. God is not going to compromise on that. In the face of the devastating loss of Nadab and Abihu, Moses commands that the worship service continue and the purposes of God prevail. This goes, this is counterintuitive, is it not? It's so um, countercultural. Now when something like this would happen, we would all stop. Take a moment of silence. Maybe take a week off. Maybe two to reflect. Do a review. Think about it. And then, and then come back later when, when, we're, when we're all sure of what was going on. And we've, we've ministered to the grieving family. But Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Come and follow me. In other words, he is about life everlasting life, and this worship service is a display 
of God's power and His majesty and the means of life through the sacrifices that point to Christ Jesus the Lord. And nothing is going to stop God in this service. And Moses understands that. And so he commands that the worship service go on. How can we apply this lesson to our lives? How can we be more like Moses? Or what can we learn from Moses? <clears throat> First, whenever we worship the Lord, whenever you are worshiping the Lord, whenever I am worshiping the Lord, we are drawing near to Him. And you do so as spiritual priests. When you draw too close to God in worship, you do so as spiritual priests. You're a spiritual priest right now. You're spiritual priests. Therefore, you should come to the Lord reverently and respectfully, full of devotion to Him, mindful of His commands, mindful of His standards, mindful of Nadab and Abihu who veered off of that path. Second lesson we can learn from this. When you draw near to Him in worship, you ought to sanctify Him. That's the whole, what's one of the purposes, the grand purposes of, of worship is to sanctify the living God, as Moses tells us. One of the chief ways that you and I sanctify God is by bringing your sacrifices of praise to Him. Paul describes the Christian as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual service. You and I are not only spiritual priests, but we're living sacrifices. And this is the way that we sanctify the Lord, is giving ourselves to Him wholeheartedly. As you bring your sacrifices of praise to Him, you ought to believe that the, that, that the God you are worshiping is the only true God. And not only that, but that He is holy, holy, holy. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13 declares, The Lord of hosts, Him you shall honor as holy. Let Him be your fear, and let Him be your dread. We're not to fear man. What can man do to us? Take away our mortal lives? But we should fear God. And the only wise and intelligent and sober thing to do is to dread God. Not run away from Him, of course, but to hide ourselves in Him because He is awesome. He is righteous. And He is holy. Third, when you sanctify God, you also glorify God. How do you glorify God in worship? Well, there are at least two ways. You glorify God in worship by A, confessing your belief in His glory, and B, in desiring to see others also confess their belief in His glory. So how do we glorify God? By believing His glory, but also desiring to see others glorify God. Wouldn't it be wonderful if others would glorify God with us on Sundays? Others that aren't here right now. Others that don't know, perhaps, Christ yet. And so we share the gospel with them. We show them love. We, we do acts of mercy, ministries of mercy, so that they might come to know the living God through the gospel and come and worship with us. Wouldn't that be wonderful? A year from now, five or six new believers in the, the pews with us. Wouldn't that be a, 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 a cause for celebration, a source of real joy? knowing that God is, is bringing, for, uh, bringing His people into His sanctuary to praise Him. Fourth, the fourth lesson we can learn from Moses and his example is if we do not sanctify and glorify the Lord when we draw near to Him in worship, then He will sanctify and glorify Himself in spite of us, in righteous judgment and at the expense of our own well-being. If we don't sanctify and glorify God as we worship Him. He will sanctify and glorify Himself. He did sanctify and glorify Himself, His name and in his, uh, his nature, when He struck down Nadab and Abihu. He was, they were offering unauthorized fire, unacceptable worship. They were sloppy, spiritually, morally. They thought more highly of themselves than they did the Word of God. And God demonstrated his disapproval of their hubris. He struck them down. The Lord God Almighty will take vengeance on those who profane his holy name. 
by trifling with him, especially trifling with him in the worship service. God will not be mocked. And finally, and in conclusion, after hearing this, seeing his son struck down, hearing the counsel of Moses that to, to glorify and, and sanctify and glorify uh, the name of God, Aaron holds his peace. Aaron holds his peace. Thanks be to God. Aaron hold his, held his peace. He has just witnessed his sons, his dear beloved sons, struck down, and he holds his peace. There's no resentment in his heart. He loves the Lord. He praises the Lord. He holds his peace. Aaron submits to the will of God, even when God's will includes hard providences, like the loss of his sons through a fiat of judicial action. Aaron submits to the will of God. He doesn't lash out in anger or sink into depth, to the depths of despair or retreat into a bottle of liquor. Instead, he surrenders himself, mind, body, and soul, to the superior hands of an almighty God who orders the events of our life for his glory and for our good. He surrenders to God. Praise be to the living God. In holding his peace, Aaron acknowledges that God's will is greater than his own will, that God's plans are wiser than his own plans, and that God's providence is good, infinitely, eternally, and everlastingly good. Another man who held his peace after receiving a hard blow from God's hand of justice is David. Think about David. He suffered tremendously because of his sin. And we can learn something from the grace that, that he manifested in his life. After committing adultery with Bathsheba, David and Bathsheba lose their baby. It is a terrible moment for this couple, for David and, and for Bathsheba. David's sin has been exposed for everyone to see. All of Jerusalem knew what had happened. It was left to no one's imagination. They all knew. He's there, and he, it's a dreadful uh, moment. And he's suffered dr the dreadful consequences of his infidelity. Before the baby dies, though, while the child is still critically ill, David comes before the Lord and remains in seclusion, fasting day and night as the baby is ill. He is at the baby's bedside, praying and fasting. And when the children and, and the, the advisors are... are, are are freaked out by this. They, they see their king, and they see he's discombobulated, and they think, man, this guy is losing it. And then the little baby dies. And the advisors are thinking, man, if, he was, if David was this way when the baby was ill, what is he going to be like now that the baby is lost? When the child dies, the advisors are afraid that David will lose his mind entirely. So overwrought was David while the, while the child was sick. What will David do now that the child is gone? But David's response is the response of a man who has gone through the storms of life and survived. He survived thanks to the sustaining hand of God. God has deeply chastened David, but David didn't fight the chastening. Instead, David submitted to the chastening rod. David has submitted to the chastening rod, and has come through the ordeal a humbled man. Remember David, he was so proud. He was so proud and so sure of himself that he didn't go out to battle with his army on the season of warring. Instead, he stayed home, right? He's the king. He can do what he wants. He can throw on his weight. If he doesn't want to go out and fight, he doesn't have to. He stays home, struts his stuff on the, uh, the roof of his palace. He spies a woman who's not his wife. He decides, you know what? I'm king. All the other guys are out fighting. I'm going to have her. A proud, arrogant man. Thought there was no consequences to his actions. Didn't understand who God is. Mocked God to his face, even though David was the apple of God's eye. David submits to the chastening rod. And he is humbled. And it's a genuine humility that David experienced. He is now lowly, not proud. He is now subdued, not lusty. He is now looking to the Lord, not to the distractions of this vain world. He has a new perspective. 
a God-oriented perspective. We pick up the account in 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning at verse 22. David said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live, but now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. These are the words of a man of tremendous faith who has been deeply humbled. He knows the living God. He knows that he will see his child someday in heaven. The child won't come back to him, but he will go to be with his son. It is a declaration, a wonderful declaration of faith. What can we learn from Aaron's example of holding his peace in the face of such fiery trials? Just two. Two lessons. When God corrects you or your loved ones for sin, it's your duty to be silent under the correction and not to quarrel with God. How do you like that? That's a tough lesson. To submit to the chastening rod, to remain silent, and also to be peaceful in our hearts. Second, the best way to quell the disquiet of your hearts when you or your loved one is being corrected by God for sin, is to meditate on His glory. If you've sinned and God puts you through a hard providence, don't complain. Submit to to His hand. He is gracious and good. He will not crush you. He will not crush you. Not completely. He will chasten you. Be out of love so that you can learn humility. And the second thing is focus on God's glory. And remember, this is happening, this hard providence is happening to me for the glory of God, that I might learn and mature and have a a more mature walk with the Lord in the future as I submit to His chastening rod and, and submit to His correction. When Aaron meditated on God's glory in the face of his son's death, he fell silent. Aaron loses his sons, but Moses shows Aaron that God has gained his glory in the execution of his justice. Either Aaron defends his sons and accuses God of being unjust, or Aaron admits that his sons sinned, seriously sinned, and acknowledge that God is just in all that he does, including the punishment of his sons. This is a tough lesson. Aaron has no grounds for dispute. As long as God is glorified, then Aaron is, sat- is satisfied. How could Aaron honor his sons at the expense of the God who had delivered him from many fiery trials? Aaron knew that God was right in this matter, and he had peace in his heart. The death of Nadab and Abihu dealt a terrible blow to the entire nation of Israel. They lost two priests, but also two sons of Israel. Two men that they knew and and loved. But no one was more devastated in this loss, obviously, than their father Aaron and Moses, their uncle. Yet these men, Aaron and Moses, remained faithful to the Lord despite the terrible, dreadful circumstances and hard providences that they both suffered. You might be going through some suffering too because of, of sin that you've committed. And you're working through the misery of that now. And it is hard. Remember this illustration from Scripture and how God graciously dealt with Aaron and gave him the peace that he needed to prevail. Moses and Aaron prevailed and continued to serve before the Lord. But it wasn't in their own strength, the strength of their flesh, um, that caused them to prevail. No, because these men were weak. They were frail. They prevailed by the strength of God working in them. They endured because God sustained them through even this hard providence, this trial. God is faithful even and especially when we are not faithful. He is steadfast when we feel like collapsing and and giving in. He bears us up on eagle's wings and he does so for his glory, but he also does so for our good. He sustains us through the hard providences for our good. 
so that we won't collapse and give in. So when you go through hard providences that are brought on by your own doing, look to God. Don't hide from Him. and Give Him the glory because He is good and just and He will see you through your hard trials too, just as He saw Aaron through his hard trial. And Aaron had peace in his heart because Aaron knew that it was good and, and, and just of God to strike down Nadab and Abihu in order to show his holiness to all of Israel and all the world. God is holy. And when we come to worship him, we must come and with joy in our hearts, trusting in Christ, his finished work on the cross, and to listen, listen to, to, uh, to God and follow him faithfully. Let us pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for, for his mercy, O oh Lord, that he took the punishment that we so richly deserve, that he died in our place, suffering the anguishes not only of his body, but of his soul. Oh, Father, we can't imagine what Christ endured on the cross when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ became the God-forsaken one, O oh Lord, because you sent him for that very purpose, to die in our place, that we might be set free from the curse of the law and be brought into your very presence. Father, we thank you for your mercy so clearly displayed in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we pray that as we move from